Now, Tosca has also asked me to do a brief introduction so you will know who it is that's chatting with you this evening. And first of all, it's a great pleasure to be back here at the Maxwell School. I always have fun when I'm here. Um, uh, the part I always look forward to the most is the Q&A because uh, students at Maxwell often challenge me, which is good fun. Uh, so hopefully you'll disagree with everything I say and try to take me down after I finish my remarks. Um, I began my career internationally uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1968. And uh, I worked for two and a half years in urban development uh, in a city called Barranquilla in the northern part of Colombia. Um, I liked what I was doing and when I got back I decided I'd try to do something else that was similar. Uh, after looking around for a little while I got a job with CARE, uh, which at that time was based in New York, it's now in Atlanta, and I worked with CARE for 20 years, the first 11 or so of those years overseas uh, in various places including Turkey, um, Colombia again, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh again, and then I was uh, kicked upstairs to headquarters and spent some years there. After a little more than 20 years with CARE, I moved over to Save the Children, and then I worked with Save the Children for 23, 24 years, um, and eventually uh, always in headquarters position, though not always in the United States, uh, because uh, Save the Children during the period I was with it, something that Tosca was just alluding to, went through a transition process where the individual members of Save the Children, like the UK, the US, Sweden, Norway, etc., ceded the management control of delivery of overseas programs to one central Save the Children International office, which was based in London, and I spent the last three or so, three or four years of my uh, career based in that central Save the Children International office. Um, so I've spent a long time working in the international field. I've worked on both the emergency and the development side. Um, and if you work in a place like Haiti today, the line between the two is rather fragile from, the time, uh, from time to time. Uh, and during that time, of course, I worked alongside dozens if not hundreds of other NGOs. Uh, and a number of them uh, were faith-based because there are a number of faith-based organizations that work in our field. So I'm going to try to give you, from my own perspective, a brief overview of the sorts of things that faith-based NGOs deal with, uh, the sorts of issues, etc., cetera, um, and, uh, and some of the issues that I feel that this throws up for them and therefore for us to discuss. Um, I'm going to discuss a range of the larger face-based non-governmental international charities and I'll base it on their public statements and also on my own experience with them in my 40 plus years of international relief and development work. In particular I'm going to look at how the faith-based uh, linkages to organized religions uh, influences their governance, their fundraising, and their operational programs. I'm particularly interested in the intersection between their mission statements or what they state as their, their sort of ethical identity uh, and their organizational behavior. And first, a bit of a caveat. There are thousands of faith-based organizations in the world that engage in humanitarian work. There are perhaps thousands in this country because a huge number of churches consider as part of their, uh, their mandate as a, uh, a Christian religion in the case of the Christian ones and uh, an Islamic religion or a Jewish religion in the case of those and those are the three religions that I'll touch on and uh, or the three faiths that I'll touch on in my remarks. Uh, charity is sort of an ingrained part of the religious uh, uh, mandate that they uh, or faith that they all believe in. Um, and so if you were to go to Haiti today, or when I went to Haiti most recently after the big earthquake there a few years ago, in addition to all the large organizations, UN and non-governmental and governmental like AID that are there, there were dozens if not hundreds of uh, churches from neighboring countries, uh, the Dominican Republic in particular, because it's just a short drive away uh, from a lot from the southern part of the United States, 
uh, small churches who had raised some money and decided they were going to go deliver it themselves. So they were, in effect, uh, faith-based organizations operating in the international sphere. Uh, however, there's not a great deal written about their individual experiences. Most of them were delivering small amounts of assistance and most of them stopped doing it uh, at a certain point in the relief. The same thing was true after the big tsunami in Asia uh, a decade or so ago, whenever that was, 2006 I guess. Um, uh, if you had gone to, um, to Aceh, you would have found hundreds of organizations from Europe, from Asia, and from the United States who had really probably never worked outside of their own country who had decided they were going to go and help. So it's a huge group of organizations. Um, and we could talk a little bit uh, about some of what I've learned about those organizations, some, some of the problems that they face, which are different than the problems the larger organizations face. Uh, but that's not what my focus is. Um, I'm, uh, because I'm not that familiar with most of them. Uh, and I also don't know uh, a great deal about uh, faith-based organizations uh, in other faiths operating out of Asia or uh, out of Latin America, but there are a lot in Asia. So I don't really know much about Hindu organizations, though there are a lot of very large ones, and I don't know much about uh, Islamic and Buddhist organizations other than those that have principal offices in the Western world. Um, so I'm going to confine myself to faith-based organizations which are founded and headquartered in Europe or the United States uh, or North America. Uh, I'll talk about two uh, very large uh, U.S. Uh, non-governmental organizations, Catholic Relief Service and World Vision. I'm sure you've all heard of both of them. Each are part of a much larger international network. Uh, uh, I'm also going to talk about two smaller Christian organizations the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, and the Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonites. And I'm going to talk about two non-Christian organizations, Islamic Relief Worldwide and the American Jewish World Service. Uh, these last two organizations are different than the first four, uh, both because they're relatively new they were founded in 1984 and 1985, respectively, so they're compared to all of the others, they're much newer. Uh, and of course that uh, raises an interesting point about why did they suddenly decide to get founded in those years, and I think it's not hard to trace it back to events in the Middle East, which is, relates a lot to how their mandates are a bit different than the others. Um, uh, most of the others that I'm talking about are uh, firmly rooted in the mainstream faith constituency and the beliefs uh, which led to their creation. Uh, Islamic uh, Relief and Jewish World Service were both clearly created in part to project a benevolent external face to the wider world of their faiths. Um, and when you read mission statements of all these different organizations, if you're a mainstream faith-based organization, you put your faith front and center in terms of your mission statement. So, um, uh, you know, if you're World Vision, you talk about wanting to uh, Christian evangelical principles, which you're going to share with the world, et cetera, et cetera, Catholics, et cetera. Um, but if you're these two organizations, which are both important organizations, uh, you're, um, you're trying to create uh, uh, a, a different vision of yourself. And uh, so you are going for some charitable uh, support from what you might call liberal members of their faith, but Islamic Relief's website, for example, talks about working with all of those in need around the world and talks about its ecumenical partnerships, in particular in its most recent website, it's highlighting a partnership with Lutheran World Federation, which is a big faith-based Christian organization. Um, and its $175 million balance sheet today reflects that it attracts a lot of Western government support for it as a liberal or um, uh, friendly Islamic organization, uh, uh, which of course also means that they're maintaining good relations with these governments. Um, the AJWS website 
clearly describes itself as a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing non-sectarian humanitarian assistance and emergency relief to disadvantaged peoples around the world. So again, the organizations are stating, we're, we're not a sectarian organization. We're not there to, uh, to help our own people or to project our beliefs onto others. Uh, we are sort of there to make you think we're not all bad people. Um, however, uh, it is also a little bit interesting if you look at their fundraising to note that however secular, secular and ecumenical both organizations uh, behave, like all faith-based organizations, their fundraising is very rooted in their own communities. In fact, it's a great strength to their fundraising. And I was mildly uh, amused and interested to see these two organizations alongside each other on their websites last week, respectively encouraging Muslims to contribute what they call zirkat or kurbani, which are religiously mandated contributions to charities. Um, uh, to them in order that they can pursue their secular work. Uh, and on the part of the um, uh, American Jewish World Service to give a high holiday donation uh, for the same sort of purposes. In both cases, uh, reminding us that uh, uh, the sacrifice of Abraham, which is the source of both of their religious holidays at the same time this week, um, uh, is something that they use as a way to generate uh, resources to pursue their mandate. In contrast to Islamic Relief and AJWS, the two largest U.S. faith-based charities, uh, Catholic Relief Service and World Vision, uh, are firmly rooted in their constituents' faith. Founded in 1943, Catholic Relief Service is governed by the U.S. Catholic Bishops' Council, or the Catholic Church. Uh, and it is part of a global network called Caritas, uh, which is based out of Rome and which reports to the Vatican. Um, World Vision, which is the big giant in, in the American charity, the international charity world, with about $1.2 billion this past year in resources, was founded in 1950 and describes itself as, quote, a global Christian humanitarian organization. In both cases, the organized religious link is a huge source of donor funds. Indeed, um, if, you, if you go to uh, evangelical churches, in the case of World Vision, or Catholic churches, in the case of CRS, you probably, this past Sunday, and if not this past Sunday, depending on how quick they are, this coming Sunday, you will, the churches will make an appeal to support the victims of the disaster in Haiti. And the churches are often a basis of appeals to the, and those people in those churches believe that these organizations are a vehicle for these people to express their faith and their religious mandate to do charitable work. So um, they are very linked. Now, the, the interesting thing, and we'll touch on this a little bit more, is that both of these organizations have reached a size and their funding sources are such that they actually have dual personalities. Because on the one hand, they are something, uh, a, an outlet that their churches will endorse of their religious faith uh, for their, their co-constituents, as it were. On the other hand, they are major partners of UN organizations <coughs> and of governments, uh, in the case of uh, World Vision US and Catholic Relief Services of the US government, USAID. Um, and this actually, as we'll see, raises some issues for them in terms of this duality of who you are to whom. Um, I can tell you, as somebody who has worked for decades alongside of World Vision and uh, Catholic Relief Services, that their programming, by and large, you read the documents that describe the work they do in areas like health and nutrition and agroforestry, uh, et cetera, uh, food relief, um, are virtually indistinguishable from what you would read on in a description of, say, Save the Children or CARE or any other um, uh, secular uh, NGO of that size. And Part of that has to do with the fact that much of their funding comes from the same sources and responds to program typologies that are actually developed with some consultation with their partners, but are developed by the donors. So if 
Um, USAID says we will do um, child survival work, then whether you're World Vision CRS or CARE or Save the Children, you develop child survival programs uh, which conform to the guidelines provided by uh, by the U.S. government. Of course, with caveats, as we'll see later on with CRS, which says uh, they are a pro-life organization. Uh, that doesn't fit with the model that uh, generally the secular organizations are projecting in terms of their international work. Um, so, uh, they are portraying themselves to their institutional donors as mainstream and orthodox and, uh, but in practice, um, there are some significant dilemmas which are caused by the conflict between mission and the broader norms of the humanitarian community that they profess to align with. Um, by accepting U.S. government grants, uh, they are subject to U.S. government rec uh, regulations on compliance. Uh, and, um, and that can, uh, and they're also, uh, because they work in the international context, they're subject to the, um, uh, the policies of the host governments within which they work and their perspectives. Now, I'm gonna give you an example or two from CRS and an example or two from World Vision. And I'll start with World Vision, just to try to explain what it is I'm, I'm talking about in more practical terms. Um, in 1980, uh, I made a visit, I was actually working in Thailand at the time, and I made a visit to Cambodia. Um, in 1979, the Vietnamese army had come into Cambodia, and it had um, uh, thrown out the government of the Khmer Rouge, which was a genocidal government that richly deserved to be thrown out, but with friends in high places, curiously enough, in both China and the United States, so it took a while to get rid of them, but Vietnam did the deed. Uh, and they installed a government which was communist but was not uh, tyrannical and genocidal and immediately opened the doors to assistance because the country had been starving for four or five years before that. And cities had been emptied out, et cetera. I'm not sure, you may or may not be at all familiar with it. But in any case, it was a very difficult situation. And there were an initial group of <coughs> two UN agencies, UNICEF and the World Food Program. And, um, three or four NGOs, including the Quakers, about whom more later, uh, and, um, and World Vision. So I went in and I was trying to actually establish a care program there at the time, and so I immediately went and I started to go to the meetings of this NGO group, NGO and UN group. Um, the Red Cross was also there, International Committee of the Red Cross. And at one of the first meetings, they brought up an issue that was troubling them. There had been a report from World Vision uh, that they were having trouble with the government who was making it very difficult for them to get their relief goods through customs. Uh, they were bringing everything in from Singapore by air. Um, and uh, it was discussed, and I guess I was there long enough to go to a second meeting because then I got sort of a little bit more of the story. And it turns out that uh, World Vision had been bringing in Bibles, which it had had translated and printed in the Khmer language to distribute along with its relief assistance. And when the government opened crates that were labeled relief goods and found Khmer language Bibles, they felt that uh, World Vision was going beyond the mandate that they had authorized when they invited them to come into the country. The other groups there were a little bit annoyed because uh, that made the government a great deal more suspicious about what everybody else was bringing in too, and they wanted to look for other fun things. And curiously enough, if they'd been transparent, they might have been successful. I had a friend named uh, Yvette Pierre Paoli, uh, who uh, had spent a lot of time in, uh, in Cambodia, a very close friend of John Le Carre, the guy that wrote The Spy That Came In From The Cold. And she wanted to do something for her people because she loved them very much. She'd been married to a, um, uh, a Cambodian general, actually, who was killed in the, in the genocide. And uh, she asked the new government, could she print and distribute copies of the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, which are the two principal religious texts that influence the culture and religion of the country? And they said, sure. So she had them printed up and shipped them in. So who knows, maybe the government would have been tolerant of the Bibles, but in any case, the, uh, the inclination of 
um, World Vision was clear, clearly not to taste that, te te test that receptivity. Um, World Vision has always had a faith-based test for job applicants. Uh, I know a lot of people who have been asked, tell us how you relate to the Lord. Uh, as part of the interview process, uh, the U.S. government suggests that that's not an actually a legitimate criteria for your hiring process if you're receiving U.S. government grants that they're going to manage. Um, and I can remember again another little anecdote, but when I was based in Geneva, 96 more or less, um, I had to meet with the head of the uh, Geneva-based World Vision office and I phoned up and tried to schedule a meeting for the next morning. He said, oh sure, come on by, we have prayers at 9, why don't you drop by around 9.30? Now, I'm sure the prayers were not absolutely mandatory for everybody in the office. Also sure if you didn't go to the prayers, you stood out as being a little different from the rest of those employees. So, you know, again, that's fine if they never took government and UN money, but it does create a kind of a double standard, which is troubling to some of their employees, uh, as well as perhaps to some of us. Um, they've also recently made uh, headlines by adopting a policy of not hiring uh, members of same-sex couples. Uh, curiously enough, they had had a policy before that. They had adopted a policy of, of tolerance towards uh, same-sex couples, and they got such pushback from their own constituency, from all the ecumenical community in the United States that they rely on for their support, that they changed the policy, which has, of course, been embarrassing for them. So if you happen to be part of a same-sex couple today, uh, you shouldn't openly state that if you're applying to them for a job. Um, uh, World Vision International also, and this is more complicated perhaps, it also promotes local church oversight of its programs and it's, the membership of its international board is composed of representatives of all the different countries where there is an ecumenical church which is part of the World Vision network. Uh, and so if... Sorry, would you mean ecumenical church or evangelical? You said ecumenical. I mean uh, evangelical. I do okay. not mean ecumenical. Right. That's what I meant. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, and uh, so if you look at their board of directors, they come from all over the world, but a lot of them come from the developing world, and a lot of them represent churches, which, and the Catholic Relief Service has the same problem, which then want to influence the programming that's done in their countries. Uh, and because they're members of the international board, they're in a good position to influence the programming. So then you have uh, somebody besides the program professionals at their headquarters and in their local international office who has an influence on what they do and whose inclination is going to be to respond to local interests. Uh, when we shift to Catholic Relief Services, this would mean Catholic institutions in India, for example, uh, where Catholic Catholics are a very small minority, but CRS was constantly having to deal with the bishops and explain to them why they couldn't just provide their 30 or 40 million dollars worth of U.S. government assistance a year to the Catholic community in India. Um, it's also led to issues where the local World Vision organization had control of the distribution of resources, and in one case that I was familiar with in Malawi, uh, it, the USAID eventually contacted World Vision's headquarters and said, you've got a problem here, there's misappropriation going on, you've got to send in some international people and sort it out. Um, so the balance between the role of the local church and the role of the international professional organization is a difficult one sometimes to balance. Um, similarly, in the 1970s and 80s, CARE, which I was working for during both of those decades, and uh, Catholic Relief Service implemented massive distributions of the United States government Title II food in a number of different countries, two of which I was familiar with were India and um, Peru. In India, CARE partnered with the state and national governments on essentially nationwide programs uh, focused on early childhood health and nutrition. Uh, but CRS was told by its headquarters that it had to work through the local Catholic bishops. Um, and again, without going into it in any detail, it, it created operational dilemmas which many CRS 
staff were happy to share with me as a colleague and said this is really difficult for us uh, because what the local bishops want isn't based on uh, uh, AID's best thinking in terms of how to deliver US government resources. So um, if you look at, and if you say, well, that was the 70s and the 80s, but if you look at CRS's website today, and I didn't look at it today, but I did look at it on Friday, it stated that Catholic institutions are our partners of choice. Now contrast that with Islamic World Relief, which was talking about how proud it is that it's partnering with LWF uh, outside of their, their faith area. So these are examples simply to suggest that a faith-based organization may face conflicts between their mission and their general public positioning as a mainstream organization, uh, as well as problems, legal, programmatic, personnel, uh, when their policies may come in conflict with more broadly accepted uh, perspectives. Um, I'd like to uh, conclude, uh, although it'll be a long conclusion, I want to assure you, Tosca, because you watch, look at your watch, uh, with a discussion of two faith-based organizations which, in my experience, have been more successful at aligning mission and practice. Uh, that, and that's the Mennonite Central Committee and the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, interestingly, both of them are small, and while I haven't checked this out on their websites recently, I don't believe that either of them accept U.S. government funding. And that means that, of course, they don't have to reach a balance between what their faith drives them to do and what uh, their acceptance of large amounts of public money uh, make them legally responsible for doing. Um, founded in 1920, the Mennonite Central Committee builds on the agricultural background of their communities. The Mennonites, as you know, if you've traveled through Pennsylvania or some other places, are great farmers. They uh, are very successful. And uh, they focus a lot of their programs internationally on sharing their agricultural knowledge with communities based on their feeling that their faith says they must share, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I first encountered them in Bangladesh in the late 1970s, and they had come to Bangladesh in the early 1970s. Uh, and uh, the Mennonite farmers there who had come over from Mennonite communities in the US were working to promote what essentially amounted to an agricultural revolution. Uh, in the years after Bangladesh achieved um, independence from uh, what we now call Pakistan, what was then East Pakistan. Uh, uh, for those of you, again, and this goes back before most of you were born, I think, um, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan were both components of one country on either fringe of India, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. Uh, one of the peculiar results of the end of colonialism in the subcontinent. And um, they were uh, religiously quite related. They were both overwhelmingly Muslim countries. Uh, they were culturally not very related at all. And the uh, people in West Pakistan had controlled the government, even though they were not the majority of the population, for most of the history of the country until uh, around 1970. Uh, and they tended to treat East Pakistan, although it was technically a co-equal part of the country, as kind of a colony. And um, eventually there was a guy named Sheikh Mujib who mobilized uh, all of the East Pakistanis to vote for one party, his party, in an uh, election. He was elected. The West Pakistani said, this is absolutely unacceptable. We can't allow this democratically elected government to take place. And their response was essentially to say, let's wipe out these upstarts in East Pakistan. And they instituted a genocidal activity, um, uh, which uh, was given a very, initially very deceptive title of a civil war, uh, because it was too one-sided to be a civil war. Uh, a colleague of mine working with CARE, uh, Bangladeshi, his father was a University of Dhaka professor who had been a guest lecturer at Harvard, they pulled him out of his house and shot him on the first or second day of, of these events. Um, and there, the idea was we get rid of the intelligentsia of East Pakistan, then it'll be easy to reassert control. They failed. Uh, although the United States, interestingly enough, was curiously, well, not so curiously, because they, seemed, they saw 
Pakistan as a bulwark against Russia or the Soviet Union. Anyway, um, but India was on the side of the uh, East Pakistanis. They won the war, they became an independent country, and they were incredibly impoverished, suffering from famines and typhoons and all sorts of awful, awful things. And <clears throat> because nothing had been invested in them, they had an agricultural environment where uh, they grew rice mostly and other vegetables and things like that uh, for six months of the year when there was rain, uh, which was basically May until September. Uh, and uh, the other six months of the year, the land was dry and fallow and they grew nothing. Uh, and there were a lot of people and a lot of them were very hungry and one of the first things that the international community w started to do was to uh, introduce winter season as they called it irrigation with uh, the digging of what they were called deep tube wells and the initial plan was that these would be used to promote the winter cultivation of rice to double or triple the agricultural production of the country. They also, um, uh, and a lot of non-governmental organizations and uh, the <coughs> Uh, other parts of the agricultural ministry were very interested in using shallow tube wells and even hand tube wells to provide local irrigation for small areas of you know, the size of this room or twice or three times the size of this room for what we might call kitchen gardens. And to do that, they not only had to dig the wells, but they also had to introduce vegetables that were totally unfamiliar to the country. When I first went to Bangladesh in 1970, and I promise this story will end someday, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'd been there for a couple of months, and it was November or something, or maybe it was January, who knows. In any case, uh, and I had a first opportunity to take a little R&R, &R, and I took a 30-minute flight right across the Brahmaputra or whatever it is to Calcutta, and then uh, went with my wife to the public market and filled up a couple of uh, uh, cold storage containers with potatoes and cabbages and tomatoes and all sorts of other vegetables which were absolutely not available in the country of Bangladesh at that time. Well, the Mennonites and also actually two, uh, two other NGOs, at least that I know about, one of them was CRS, interestingly enough, and one of them was uh, CARE, for which I was working, worked with the government to bring in um, winter variety vegetables, all sorts of things, capsicum and uh, leafy vegetables, uh, spinaches, shocks, etc. Uh, and, and teach the farmers how to grow them and help the farmers to have the water to grow them with and uh, then to try to introduce them to the general public. So uh, somebody that worked for me in care would go out on Friday afternoon or Saturday morning and pick, load up his pickup truck with vegetables and bring them to the hotels in Dhaka to try to encourage the hotels to buy these vegetables. The program was an amazing success. If you go to Bangladesh today, or even 10 or 15 years after it all began, during the all times of year, with huge cold storage houses all over the country, you can get any kind of vegetable that you get any place in Asia 12 months a year. <clears throat> we knew the program was successful, curiously enough, when we found that the farmers weren't cooperating with us on getting together the vegetables to sell on the weekend because the uh, merchants were coming out from Dhaka and were buying them directly from the farm stand from them, uh, which was a great sign of success. I mean, we were, couldn't have been more delighted. The guy that was running the project was a little upset because mm -hmm. he saw it as his role to fill his truck and get it into his clients, but for the rest of us, it was just absolutely amazing. It's a little bit like agricultural research stations around the world know they've got a successful crop varietal when the local farmers start to steal the, steal the seeds. And so it's a real tip-off that they've, they've got something that works. Anyway, um, the Mennonites were, uh, were living their faith on the ground, and they continue to do it today uh, in their work. They, uh, today they get contributions of agricultural products, notably meats, uh, from farmers in Canada and the United States. They can them, and then in emergencies like Haiti, they ship them overseas as their contribution direct farm to beneficiary. Uh, skipping all the uh, other organizational encounters. So they're still, they're still into translating their vision of how they live their faith on their farms to how they live their faith in their work internationally. Um, the Quakers uh, have as their focus um, uh, trying to support victims of persecution uh, and to promote equality of access uh, across the world. Uh, 
they deliberately choose to work in places where, which may not be very popular. Um, again, some time ago, but notably in the 19, late 1960s and the 1970s, the Quakers were very prominent for their work in North Vietnam. And Jane Fonda, notably, was, uh, when she wanted to make her political statement, was hosted by the Quakers when she went to Hanoi. Uh, uh, but they did it because they said, look, we can't leave anybody out, and it's not fair that all the aid is focused on South Vietnam, and you know there are poor people in the North as well. Um, they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their 300 years of opposing wars in um, 1947, uh, and even today they continue to work in difficult places. Um, they're not the only organization working in North Korea, but they're probably the only organization working in North Korea without Western governmental assistance. Um, so they continue to, to, to live their faith through their work. The quid pro quo that both of these organizations accept gladly, but it's certainly something we have to recognize, is that uh, they're not attracting a lot of government support and they're not looking for a lot of government support. So they're, and, and neither of them have um, faith groups in the United States or Canada that are so large unlike the evangelicals or the Catholics, that a faith-based group alone could provide them with 100 plus million dollar budgets. Um, anyway, those are my examples. And uh, so sort of in summary, and I hope to provoke questions rather than to give you the answers, when faith-based organizations can align their mission and values with their work, they can be a powerful force and do some very good things. More often, for the larger ones particularly, as faith-based organizations have become large and global, the competition between mission and marketplace, between beliefs and more generally accepted best practices have created tensions both within those organizations and between those organizations and the broader community within which they work. And that is it. Everybody will disagree. Yes. Okay. Let's start here, and then we've got two other questions over there. Can I, um, my question? Uh, would you? But as you introduce yourself, let me know if you have any experience, as I know some of you do, working in the international area. Um, my name is Ayala. I am an MPA student this year, and uh, I have no experience working in the international area. Um, and I was wondering, actually, about how secular civil society organizations can partner with faith-based organizations without taking on some of the slightly problematic um, discriminatory policies. So for example, the Salvation Army does a lot of really amazing stuff. They, um, they feed countless homeless people, they house everybody. I remember growing up and seeing lines and lines of people the first Tuesday of every month um, homeless people would come from all around in San Diego to uh, get food. However, they, they discriminate against the transgender community. There's, there's certain things that are kind of deal breakers. How do you partner with an organization that does a lot of good without discriminating yourself by virtue right. of helping? Right. Well, I think you do it on the basis of the particular project activities that you choose. So for example, um, I doubt that we would do uh, a, a general public health project with either CRS or, um, uh, or certainly not one which was likely to get us in, embroiled in uh, family planning or something else that might not be uh, acceptable to them. <clears throat> but. Uh, in many countries, uh, we both Save the Children and CARE have partnered with both World Vision and Catholic Relief Services in food distribution projects. Uh, you, most of the time, they would be, you're using the same donor sources, either the World Food Program or the U.S. government, or perhaps some European source. Uh, and most of the time, the criteria for the distributions are very, very strict, and, and they're not going to violate them in a big emergency situation. Uh, so you, you, you work because you have to, under the way the international system works in an emergency, you have to divide up the different areas that are going to be helped by 
by organization so you don't all try to overlap in the same area where you get in real competition in terms of targeting beneficiaries. Uh, uh, but, you know, in, in Haiti, right after the earthquake a few years ago, um, the World Food Program requested organizations to put in bids for a certain kind of distribution program with the resources they were going to provide, the ration they were going to provide, to reach different districts in the city uh, of Port-au-Prince. And we were working right alongside World Vision. They picked District 1 and 2, and we picked District 3 and 4, and CRS picked District 5, and CARE picked District 6 and 7, more or less. Um, so there are a lot of the kinds of things that we do where uh, there's not a conflict. And the organizations I've been talking about are hardly the most extreme in terms of imposing their beliefs uh, on, on their program modalities, and certainly not when they're dealing. I think the bigger problem they have actually is if you're in an evangelical church in California giving 50 bucks to World Vision, you implicitly understand that they're supporting a very evangelical Christian vision of how that aid should be delivered. Uh, and World Vision doesn't tell you no, but actually is taking a grant to couple your money with U.S. government money under rules that are identical to those that CARE or, or um, say the children are using. Uh, in the far corner and then in the blue jacket, I think, was the first. Go ahead, Earl. Uh, so my name is Earl Shank, an MBA student, and I have a little bit of international experience. Um, and a small amount of collaboration was done with my international experience with Baptist World Aid, so a little bit of FTO experience. Um, my question has to do with staffing and, and how staff may or may not move between these organizations and what that does to potentially group think within the organization or um, sort of a, a lack of experience with other organizations and how they might handle problems? Well, uh, in the larger organizations, uh, and certainly the ones that I've been discussing, staff move back and forth all the time. The, it is a very fungible marketplace for personnel. Uh, and uh, most of them are not wearing uh, their beliefs on their sleeve to the point where a secular organization would have a problem uh, having them on their staff. Uh, there might be a, if, if World Vision were hiring someone that had cut their eye teeth on uh, working with Save the Children, they'd probably still get asked the, you know, the, the faith-based questions. So they would have an extra, an extra hoop that they would have to go through in order to be hired. But their work with a Save the Children in whatever type of work it was that World Vision was hiring for would be considered a huge asset. Um, we poach each other's employees continuously. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Walt Donner. I um, also lived in Colombia for a few years. I was in Bogota teaching English and doing some research on economic development. Um, my question for you is regarding motivation of these organizations. Um, you initially had outlined essentially two. Uh, one was to project a development phase to the, of the religion uh, worldwide. Um, can you give examples of? Well, those were the two non-Christian organizations right. that came out of, I believe, their face experience in the Middle East and dealing with their constituencies in Europe and North America and, you know. Yes, that, those were an example. Right, and then the, the second motivation, I guess, would be as a, as a vehicle to express their constituents' faith. Their faith, yeah. Um, in, in that regard, how much of that do you see as manifesting itself in terms of proselytizing, or is it more just this is our duty as members of this religion to um, act in a church and I think and that's, how does it create tensions? That's, the, that's a really, really excellent question. And I'm going to, not that any other questions haven't been excellent also, but uh, because you're, you've hit the nub of a very big issue. Uh, in my experience, uh, Catholic Relief Service staff have never proselytized in any program that I've ever seen any place in the world. However, if they, uh, to some degree, take some direction from the local bishops and, you know, there's proselytization by, uh, by resource transfer. So uh, when uh, World Vision, to jump from one example to the other, 
uh, distributes resources to tribal people in the Maiman Singh Hill District who are non-ethnic Bangladeshis who have come in from other places and are Christian, there is a cause and effect question here, which is are they targeting the resources because these people are Christian, uh, but they're also perfectly worthy beneficiaries, or are they targeting these resources so as to ensure that these people remain Christian and aren't lured into the mainstream religion where more resources, public jobs, et cetera, are gonna be available? And um, that's a difficult one to answer, but I think certainly in the example that I gave, um, the person who had been a pastor before he became the, uh, the head of World Vision in Bangladesh at that time was well aware that there weren't a lot of Christians in Bangladesh and it would be nice if the Christians who were there didn't starve to death and had robust economies in a community which could survive. Um, there are a lot of smaller uh, faith-based organizations which actively proselytize and a lot of them begin by proselytizing and only become involved in resource distribution as an adjunct to that, uh, particularly maybe in the case of emergencies. So I can't, I can't and I wouldn't speak to particularly egregious examples of that, but I think there's no question that that exists. I had somebody approach me a few months ago to say they were really concerned by what was going on in Syria. And how could they make a contribution, and this is someone that had quite a bit of money, how could they make a contribution to an organization which could assure them that their assistance would get to the deeply affected and persecuted Christians in the region? And I, my answer was, there is no mainstream NGO which would, for a second, tell you that they would target your resource in that fashion. I then steered him to the Orthodox charities, which have a lot of constituents in the region, and I thought wouldn't have to tell him that for him to figure out that they were probably helping to make sure that the, at least the Orthodox Christian churches in the region weren't disappearing. So it happens. I, mean, I didn't care one way or the other, but uh, 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 there are a lot of other people helping all sorts of other constituencies there, but, but it is absolutely a problem. And many people who give money want to see it promote quote unquote Christ teachings. Can I just add that? Yeah, it's, it's a problem, but at the same time, in my experience in practice, it's not as big a problem as some people assume. Especially there is a bit of a, I'm going to generalize a little bit, so there are many exceptions. There's a bit of a tendency amongst uh, either people who are secular themselves or who are working as staff in secular NGOs to assume that any faith-based organization will want to proselytize in addition to what we were referring to as resource uh, distribution or you know, engaging development aid. Um, and in my experience, that comes that is often not justified, though sometimes it is, and it's particularly with some of the smaller ones, yeah, I would I say. Yeah, I think it's the smaller ones it's that the are, smaller ones that are particularly, more likely to do that. Yeah, the big ones really try to stay you're far away from it. But then there are also... Because they lose their U.S. government funding and their U.N. funding, among other things. Among other things, and even more broadly, reputationally. Now, of course, there are certain religions uh, within, for instance, Protestantism that are more about witnessing, right? Evangelicals are taught to witness, right? I, I have met these American um, um, cleaning lady and her family who, who come once a week to our house, and they're evangelicals, and we are by tradition Catholics, and in the beginning they felt they needed to try to bring their faith to us, and we had to say politely but firmly, thank you, but we're fine the way we are. But that is their duty, um, whatever you or I might think about, but that is what, and actually uh, part of the reason why I think, for instance, CSR as a Catholic uh, NGO would stay far away is because the Catholic yeah. Church traditionally has not emphasized that so much, although there are strains within Catholicism, I have two uncles who are Catholic priests, um, who, who now are starting to emphasize that. So I think there's a lot of uh, explanatory factors why there's a large variation, but a lot of times people say, oh, you must be wanting to do proselytizing, and actually most mainstream <coughs> FBOs want to stay far away from that. Yeah, I think there may be a little problem with the Mormons sometimes. I can't comment. Uh, but uh, uh, and uh, they, as we know, 
uh, all young Mormons have to spend a yes. period of time abroad, essentially projecting their faith, and yeah. you can call it proselytizing or not. Uh, but uh, when they start to do emergency aid, sometimes I've encountered with care, they want to put strings on so it, we wouldn't. all we want to say, both of us, is be careful to don't do they don't generalize. Rush. Don't it generalize. Happen either way. There's a lot, it's a big spectrum, and after the break, we'll talk about that. Um, besides the, the proselytism, do you think that because most of the FBOs are Christian, um, at the end, in some way, could create some inequity? Because some don donors could give more money to secular organizations? Mm. Well, I, I mean, first of all, um, most international assistance comes from countries which are predominantly Christian. So it is inevitable that their delivery mechanisms are, in a sense, coming from that background. And that raises a much broader question that's not about World Vision or CRS, but how much are we projecting Western values in the rest of the world? Uh, and how much are those Western values influencing the choices we make and the value system that we project to those that want to go to work for us and succeed within our communities? I mean, I have dozens of Bangladeshi friends who started out working for care in Bangladesh as local staff and now work internationally in all sorts of different places. They have essentially accepted the Western UN NGO value system as the framework for their work. It's not a religious, it wouldn't be recognized by the Westerners that are doing it as a religious value system per se, though it comes out of millennia of, you know, Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. I mean, you take those three together, and it certainly influences everything that's done overseas, uh, except, of course, that as I've said, and it's insufficiently documented, and maybe, Tosca, you know a lot more about it than I do, but there are, I am sure, billions of dollars of assistance out there uh, within Asia in particular, going from non-Christian organizations to non-Christians, and presumably they are projecting the same thing. Some of the, some incredibly effective organizations in, uh, there are some incredibly effective organizations in India, some of which are explicitly Hindu in their tradition and origin. Yeah, just also one other nuance around staffing. Uh, what you said really about World Vision and hiring, that everybody is asked during hiring interviews, what is your relationship to God, etc. Um, so we have several uh, Maxwell alums, uh, some of whom have spoken in this class, who work in faith-based NGOs, and one of them it comes back every June uh, to Central New York because his family is here. And so he has climbed up the ladder uh, in World Vision to the level of country director, which is a relatively high position. Um, and he has told me that informally that um, he's not religious. He is, uh, he calls himself agnostic. But he says, I don't, I do join some of the, the prayer groups. There is a social expectation that you do that. Um, but he said, I can rise to the level of a country director, but I cannot go above that level. So the people who are more senior than that have to come from the faith uh, direction. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, yeah. it's just a uh, one person anecdote. We've also had a, a lot who spoke in this class who works at Samaritan's Purse, hmm. which is another example of a more evangelical uh, Christian organization, which is also really interesting. And I do, I think Samaritan's Purse is a little, <coughs> has it in their mission to, I believe, to yeah. proselytize. Uh, absolutely, they're, they're further along a further continuum along. than World Vision is. Uh, okay, one, two. Two more, three more questions, and then we need to bring this to a close. Hi, I'm Francisco Santamaria, an MBA student, um, and a little bit of experience with international organizations, but not so much faith-based ones. Uh, in the current geopolitical climates, what are some of the biggest challenges facing uh, these faith-based organizations? For example, the Aga Khan Foundation does so much good work, and is uh, Ismaili Muslim, but I don't think they explicitly target just uh, Ismailis for aid. No, they're, uh, they're the, the Agra Khan does great work. Uh, their particular Islamic persuasion is so liberal that um, uh, they're considered uh, heretics by ISIS and other groups, and uh, if they can catch them, they kill them. 
Uh, but, um, so I don't know, I got distracted on that one. I don't think I've answered your question, but the answer is, I mean, clearly uh, there is a wide range of these organizations. Uh, say your question again, I'll try again. What, what are some of the biggest challenges facing FBOs in the current climate? Okay. Well, the biggest challenge we're already alluded to is that in certain parts of the world, you know, there was, it, when I grew up in this world in the 70s and the 80s, uh, as long as the Cold War was going on, there was a tacit agreement between the, uh, the big powers in the Cold War to leave humanitarian assistance outside of their realm of competition. That meant that I could go to uh, Ethiopia when in the dirge was in power, a communistic regime, and uh, it, Russia was the dominant influence in the country at the time. And when I wanted to go out and explore a local market, my Ethiopian government guy said, eh, I'm a little nervous. And I said, why? He said, well, they might mistake you for a Russian. And we know, like the Russians, they might shoot you. But as an American in a country controlled by the Russians, I couldn't have had it better. I mean, because, and by the way, it would have worked absolutely the same in the reverse. I mean, a Russian in, in Kenya, for instance, would have been seen as a very harmless person they'd have been happy to have in the local market, probably. Um, uh, and once the Cold War went away, then it was open season on the resources that non-governmental organizations represent, first of all. And when violence was necessary to obtain those resources, uh, uh, Red Cross workers were killed in Somalia in one of the earliest of the events that really showed that it wasn't safe to do our kind of work anymore in certain environments. You don't have to look very far in the Middle East today to see that all sides seem to bomb hospitals rather freely. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, I mean, whether it's Afghanistan or Aleppo or uh, Yemen, it doesn't matter. Um, if you uh, have a big sign on top of your tent saying, non-governmental organization, independent, neutral, charitable, health-oriented, taking care of poor, sick people, they say, well, that's a nice target, and boom all. So, uh, I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but, but it is bloody awful, quite frankly, what's happening in places like that. So that's the biggest, biggest problem. And the second biggest problem is trying to convince anybody that you, as a Western organization, aren't fully aligned with Western value systems and governments and therefore that they should see you as anything other than, I mean, when we worked, uh, and I'm speaking here of Save the Children, in Afghanistan, uh, shortly after the Taliban had taken over, and well before 9-11, um, we worked relatively amicably with the government of the Taliban, doing things that they formally said they didn't allow, like girls' education. Uh, we did it through negotiation, and we did it through a, a philosophy of what we call acceptance. So when people offer us armed protection, we say, no, thank you. We'd rather negotiate with the different groups in the area and get them to agree that we're not doing them harm and they're not going to target us. Um, and that system has really gotten terribly weakened uh, because there isn't much acceptance. It's very hard to convince the remnants of the Taliban that are in Afghanistan today that any non-governmental organization working under the auspices of the government could possibly be neutral. Ruslan, last question. My name is uh, Ruslan. I'm from Azerbaijan. My international experience is with American Councils for International Education, the NDI, National Democratic Institute, and Human Rights House in Tbilisi. My question in is... Baku? Uh, in Baku? In Tbilisi. In yes. Tbilisi? Yes, but I'm from... You are from yes. Azerbaijan. Yeah, I'm from Azerbaijan, and I have one year experience working in Georgia. Okay. Please. My question is: um, a lot of times, uh, FBOs uh, face issues with local authorities in countries, uh, especially with regard to registration. That they have some of the FBOs have to register locally, either as faith-based organizations or as uh, local affiliates of international NGO in order to be able to legally function in the country. And a lot of times they, especially in countries like Azerbaijan where there is an authoritarian regime, they face, um, they face uh, let's say, ill... Ill, uh, ill will, they're not wanted. Yeah, yeah, they're not accepted there. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, from your experience, and I don't have any information about this, to what extent faith 
faith-based organizations are compromising their values and mission in, uh, in those countries in order to be able to stay and at least on minimum level continue their uh, operations. Uh, so uh, they're saying we won't really behave like an evangelical Christian organization. Uh, we're going to behave the way you want us to behave, which is in a, following the government's dictates, whatever. you teaching of Yeah. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I have no ex uh, experience of my own that would address the question. I do know that it's increasingly difficult to register and to get permission to do programs all over the world uh, because governments have become far more assertive about um, trying to understand what's happening in their countries. Uh, in Turkey, um, Save the Children, when I was with them, tried for years to register in Turkey <clears throat> to do work in Syria, largely. Uh, and it just wanted to be able to have a legal basis for his presence in the country. We, we certainly went, weren't going to, we weren't offering to do development or relief assistance there. Um, the Turkish government, we sort of really got into this and it took, you know, we found friends, high, high friends in government who would tell us little secrets unofficially. And it seems that uh, in an earlier period, there was a Save the Children employee whom they thought had empl employed as one of their local employees <coughs> a Kurd who might have had associations with the Kurdish Workers' Party. And because of that, there was a black mark on our dossier with the government that meant we were, hell was gonna freeze over before we got registered to officially work in Turkey uh, with any permanent rights. They let us work but very unofficially. So there's a Save the Children office in Diyarbakir today, and probably one just north of Aleppo on the, across the border, uh, funneling assistance, but all on short-term tourist visas. The expatriates, none of them have a residence visa. So they have to leave the country every three months or something and get a new visa and come back in. So governments are making it tough whether you are faith-based or not faith-based. With, with that, let's bring it to a close because we to cover uh, some other related things. But thank you very much for this very interesting.